Okay, we are holding over here in the 58th, uh, 58th Tehillim, number Nun Ches, 58. And we spoke about last week the idea that a person has to stand up for the truth. When they see that there's something that is wrong that is going on, in the world, in society, in their family, in their shul, when they see that something is, is not right, they have to stand up for what is right. They have to stand up for the emiss, for the truth, and even have to be valiant about it. And they have to be strong, demonstrative sometimes. Even as Rav Hirsch and others point out, sometimes they have to be even very forceful to make sure that they get the message across. I was thinking as I was preparing today that... I think that we all know, to a great extent, this is not really the mahalach, it's not really the way that we can go about things in our generation. Because we're living in a generation of such fragility that if you even look at a person in the wrong way, as if to say that you're disappointed in that which they are doing, or you don't hold of what they are involved with, just a look of disapproval is already enough to crack a person and break a person in the world today. So certainly if you are, if you end up, certainly if you end up saying that, saying something to the person that is going to chastise them or is going to give them rebuke or to try to put them in the right place, most people in the world today are not capable of being able to hear even loving and gentle criticism or rebuke that you're giving them. So I was thinking perhaps, and it's very much based on this week's Parsha, maybe there's another way in which we have to go about how we're going to make changes in other people and make changes in situations that we are not so happy with and the things that are going on around us, again, whether it's in marriage, whether it's in family, whether it's in the kahila, whether it's in the world, whether it's in your town, there are so many things that need changes and need to be worked on and need to be shifted in the right direction. How are we going to do it? So there's a famous story, which I'm sure I probably told over maybe close to a thousand times over the years. So it's not going to be a chiddish, it won't be a new idea to you. Rav Yisrael Salanter, who was the father of the Musa movement, was himself from the G'dayla Yisrael, he was from the greatest, greatest Tamir HaChachamim sages of the generation. He was known for his, his ingenious mind that he had. He was a super genius. His mind was always working nonstop in Torah. He was thinking about everything all the time. As a matter of fact, they tell over a story that Rav, with Rav Yisrael Salanter, we know that the halach is that when you're in the restroom, you're not allowed to think about Torah. But he couldn't turn off his mind. His mind was always working in something, in a Gemara, in a Chumash, in a verse. He couldn't turn off his mind. So the only way that he could go to the restroom was if he would pace back and forth for like a half an hour, push every word of Torah out of his brain that he possibly could, and then quickly run into the restroom while his mind was some semi-empty from the thoughts of Torah, and then he would have to run out of there immediately because his mind was always working like that. So he was himself resigned, or res- he resigned himself to be a very private person. He wasn't looking to be famous, he wasn't looking to be the father of the Muslim movement, he wasn't looking to make changes in the world that he would go down in history as being one of the most influential Rabbanim and, and, and Sadiqim that the world has seen in the last several hundred years. But he saw that the world was falling apart. He saw that the Jewish people were very, getting very lax in their midas and their character. He saw the year of Shemaim was out the door. He saw that people were just not behaving with the, with the class and the dignity that he felt that the Jewish people should be. So at a certain point, he decides that he has no choice but to go and get involved in changing the world. But Rav Yisrael Salanta said the following thing. In the beginning, I thought I'm going to go, I'm going to change the world. 
until I realized it was too big of a job, too big, big of a task, impossible. So I decided that I'm going to change my country. We lived in Lithuania. He said, fine, I'll change Lithuania. Then he saw too many people, too, it's not going to work. I'll change my town, Salant, wherever he was living, too much. I'll change my neighborhood, too much. I'll change my street, my, my one street, I'll change. I'll change my house. Who can't change the house? Go in, you speak to your wife, you speak to your kids, you make the necessary changes. He said, even that was too much. Until I realized the only person I can change is myself. But because Rav Yisrael Salanta changed himself, he ended up changing his wife and his children and his neighborhood and his town and his city and his country and the whole world. And all of Klal Yisrael today, 200 years after he's no longer in the world, every single yeshiva in the world, and every single Jew that ever picks up a sefer of Musar, Mesil Sisharim, Chayvis Levava, Shari Tshuva, and, and on and on goes the list. Anyone who ever picks up one of those books to work on themselves and make themselves a better person, it's because 200 and something years ago, Rav Yusuf Salanta decided he's going to change himself. And by doing that, it created a ripple effect through the entire world. He changed the world, he changed the very face of Klal Yusuf. So if we're going to have an impact where we want to stand up for the truth and we want to tell people to change and become better, become better Jews, be a better person, I think that the Avaida, that the real work starts at home, meaning on ourselves, and then perhaps we will be zeichet through our own hard work and our own efforts and becoming a better person and a greater person. We will be someone that is a representative of what HaKadosh Baruch Hu really wants in the world. And then even without saying the words of chastisement, without rebuking another person or giving them the constructive criticism, it sounds better when you say rebuke in that way, constructive criticism. Well, I'm just giving you constructive criticism. Then we'll be able to have a real impact on the people whose lives we would like to change. And... I believe that we find such an idea in this week's parsha, in the very beginning. Yitzchak was 40 years old. When he took Rivka as a wife. But then the verse goes on and says, He took Rivka, Bas Besuel, she was the daughter of Besuel, Ha'arami, Mi Padan Aram, from the city of Padan Aram, Acha is Lavan Arami, she was the sister of. Lavan, Loyle Isha, so Yitzchak took this woman as a wife. So Rashi is bothered on the spot over here by the following question. We know that the Torah never repeats itself unless it's absolutely necessary. HaKadosh Baruch Hu's ink is holy ink. It's cost a lot of money, so to speak. He doesn't drop ink for no reason. So if you already know who somebody in the Chumash is, and you already know what their lineage is. We just learned it in last week's parsha. There is no reason to write it again because HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't waste the holy ink of the Torah. So Rashi asks, Didn't the Torah already write? She's the daughter of Besuel. Her father was Besuel. Her brother was Lavan. And she came from the city Padan Aram. We just learned it in Chaya Sara. When we are introduced to Rivka, when Eliezer is going to find a wife for his, for his master, Avram and Yitzchak, he walks and he finds Rivka, Bas Besuel, Acha is loving in Padan Aram. So why is the Torah saying it again? Why does Hashem have to teach us that? El Lahagid Shivcha, it's coming to explain and bespeak the praises of this young woman. Shehai Sebas Rasha. She was the daughter of a Russia. Basu was a big Russia. As we see, he tried to poison Eliezer. He ends up getting the Malach, the angel, turns everything around. He ends up getting killed himself. He was a wicked man. The Acha is Russia. And she was the sister of a wicked man. Lavan, as we're going to see throughout the Torah. Lavan was wicked of the most wicked. The, what he did to his son in law, uh, Yaakov Avinu, was beyond riches, beyond wickedness. And she came from a town that was filled with people that were wicked. 
Padan Aram was probably similar to, I don't know, Sunset Boulevard on, a, on, a, on, a, on the worst day of the year. So everybody over there is Rishoyim, the wicked people. So she's the daughter of a wicked man. She's the sister of a wicked brother. She comes, she lives in a place. Everybody's Rishoyim, everybody's wicked. And she did not learn from their deeds. She didn't learn from their actions. Which is the great anomaly that Rivka was. Because the Rambam teaches us that the way of a person is that we are deeply influenced by the people that we are around. We're influenced by the people, by the place, by the seviva, by the atmosphere. It's an inescapable truth of the world. You are going to be influenced by the people that you are around. You cannot deny that. And the Torah is being made, is testifying on Rivka that not only was her father Russia, that's who she grew up with. She grew up with a man who was spewing forth wickedness and rishus all day long, saying sheker or serving of Zara, talking about people badly, talking about those that follow God. You know, it's like, like uh, the, the secular Israeli that grows up in Israel. He grew up on the mantra of the, of the Chilani world, the religious people are wicked and they're the scum of the society and they're the leeches and the parasites. That's what he grew up with. So for that guy to get out of his mind, if he ever sees the beauty of Yiddishkeit, that maybe it's not so bad. It, it's like pulling, a, pulling part worlds inside of a person to get there. We used to have a handyman who told us that he grew up in Tel Aviv and his parents refused. He was a Bal, he was a Bal Shuva. Rabbi Guy was him. He grew up in Tel Aviv. His parents refused to give him a bar mitzvah. Chas v'sholem. Bar mitzvah, our son, in the land of Israel? Chas v'sholem, we would do such things. So, so what? So how's that person supposed to... But he came to Yiddishkeit in the end. Rivka Yimeinu. She grew up in a house. The whole tone of the house was, was Rishus, the opposite of Torah. She has a brother, the guy is doing the, the most, his, he's called Lovin Ha'arami, the word Arami, if you switch the letters around, becomes Ramai. Aramai is a trickster. Her brother was the biggest trickster in the world. He was deceitful. He pulled the wool over everybody's eyes. He cheated people out of everything. And she lived in a town, wherever you go, there's a billboard for this and a billboard for that. And there's people walking on the streets doing immoral things. It's crazy, it looks like Los Angeles. And yet, she didn't learn anything from their actions and their deeds. That means that the Kedusha that was inside Rifki Imeno was so powerful and it was so strong that she herself was a woman that was defending the truth, was living for the truth, that believed in the truth, and she didn't care what anybody else did. Now, yeah? Do you know anything about her mom? Um... We must someplace. I don't know. Because it doesn't say about, doesn't say. I don't know. Who was her mother? It says in the Torah beforehand, no? It says who was her mother from last week. Um, uh, where does it say? In the nation. I can't find it right now. Hold on. Anyway, Isha um, Shalom. Thinking maybe she was not that. She was not uh, evil. Tell us, Isha. It should be right here. Okay, I don't know why. I can't find it right now. Um, it should be like right here. Okay, anyway. Uh, 
Okay, anyway, we, we know, I, I don't know, I have, to, I have to get you the, the answer to that question. I'm interested only because, did she, Rivka, do this all on her own? Uh, out oh, oh, that's right, it's the, it's the end of, I'm sorry, it's the end of the partial from the week before. Hold on one second. Okay, so um, here we go. It's the end of Pasha's Vayera. So it says that Okay, so there was a the, Avram had a, had a brother named Nachor, who had a wife named Milka, and she ended up giving him sons. As Uts Bechor Ves Buz, Achi Ves Kemuel, Avi Aram, Ves Keshet Ves Chazu Ves Pildash Ves Yidla Ves Besuel. So, I guess the wife, the mother, is Milka, the mother of Bes- the Anazar. That's the mother of Besuel, and then it says of Besuel Yalid as Rivka. So who was the mother of, who was her mother? It doesn't say. Well, it doesn't say. Okay, there has to be Chazal somewhere that tells us who the mother of Rivka was. Anyway, for some of the Why the Torah doesn't say who her mother was? I don't know. Fine. We'll have to look that up. In the meantime, in the meantime, Rivka was able to transcend all the evil that there was around her, and she did not succumb to the pressure that was there. Which is an anomaly, as we're saying, because the nature of a person is they are influenced. Now, it's important to point out, Rivka's greatness, Rivka's kedusha, Rivka's dar, even though that she remained in that state of purity, she apparently did not change her father, she did not change her brother, and she did not change the Anshe Rasha, the people that lived in that town. She didn't. So that means that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants us to become the best that we could become. He wants us to lift ourselves up to the level that will be on the highest Madrega that we could be on. Whether or not our actions are going to influence the people that are around us or not, that's up to the Rebbein Nisham. That's HaKadosh Baruch Hu's decision. You got to be from, you got to keep the mitzvahs, you have to become the best God-fearing woman that you could become, and you do your job, ah, you have an impact on your, your spouse, you have an impact on your children, you have an impact on the person that you sit next to in the shul, maybe you will, maybe you won't. Maybe you won't. Don't give up on yourself because you don't see that you are doing any, you are making a difference or a dent in the person. I told over this story also a thousand times. But years and years ago when I was learning in Nair Yisrael, the JCC, the, the community is a very close-knit community in Baltimore. And even the non-religious, they, everybody gets along. Even the religious, they, everybody gets along. The JCC was for years closed on Shabbos. And they decided one year that, you know what, we could do more business if we open up on Shamas. So the Jewish Community Center of Baltimore, after 40 years, 50 years, never being open on Shabbos, they, they made a, a, a declaration that we're going to start opening up on Shabbos. The Froom community was up in arms. And they said, you're the Jewish Community Center. And we also come there, and we also use it, and now you're going to start being open on Shabbos. How can you desecrate the Shabbos like that publicly? So they made a very big gathering of all of the Frum community, they rented out a big auditorium, and everybody came to this gathering to make a stance. Stand up for the truth, what we're talking about over here. Stand up for the truth that the Jewish community of Baltimore cannot allow the JCC to open up on Shabbos. And they had the best speakers, my friend, they had the best speakers there to inspire. It turned out in the end that it worked. And the JCC took so much pressure from the community that they decided not to open. So you see, it does work. In the right place, in the right time, in the right way. But one of the stories that was told was of a woman who was becoming a Baalist Tshuva, and she wanted nothing more to keep Shabbos, than to keep Shabbos. 
But her husband was not into this Shabbos business at all. He's like, Shabbos, Saturday, come on, that's my day out, that's what I do, Friday night, I go here, Shabbos day, I go to the game, all the things. I'm not keeping Shabbos. Fine. She said, don't keep Shabbos. Friday night, you remember the story, he comes home to the house Friday afternoon, and his wife opens the door, she's dressed in her gown, she's makeup, hair done, she looks beautiful. And this is, what's going on over here? She says, come in. He comes into the house. He sees the table is set with the china and the crystal. The, the fragrance is wafting from the kitchen, delicious smells. He says, what's going on over here? She says, tonight's Shabbos. Oh, okay. She brings him up to the bedroom, shows him the bath is drawn. There's a glass of wine. There's a cigar. He's got everything. She says, please, get yourself ready. She has his clothes waiting for him. He drinks has a cigar, has the bath, comes downstairs. She has a meal, gourmet beyond, the beautiful night. He's like, wow, Shabbos, this is pretty nice. Next week comes along, she's like, no, so we can keep Shabbos? No, 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 I'm not ready for Shabbos, but I'm not ready for Shabbos. Next week, Friday, he comes home, there she is again, greets him at the door, beautiful, everything, the house exactly the same. He's like, wow, Shabbos, very nice. They have a beautiful suda, a beautiful meal. Everything is fantastic. She says, my dear husband, so you think that we could start keeping Shabbos? No, it's nice. I enjoy the dinner. I enjoy the company. It's so nice to see you. Looks so beautiful and everything, but no, it's not for me. I'm not, I'm not holding it. Next week, the husband comes home. He's waiting by the door this time. He's waiting for his wife to open the door. No answer knocking on the door. He's waiting to see his wife in the gown. Nothing. He opens the door himself. He says, the house is a mess. Pillows all over the place. The house is filthy. The trash is overflowing. His wife's walking around like a shmata. There's nothing in the kitchen cooking, nothing. And he comes in and he says, well, what's going on over here? She says, oh, what a day I had today. You have no idea what a crazy day. I'm busy, this and that. Oh. And he looks at his wife, but Shabbos! Shabbos is coming! Ah, she said, Shabbos, you want Shabbos? I'll make Shabbos. And she said, that's the way she got her husband to keep Shabbos. <laughs> Maybe you'll have an influence. Maybe you won't have an influence. Maybe you'll find the chachma, the wisdom of a woman like that to, to get your husband to come along further. Maybe you won't, but it doesn't matter. That's what, the, that's what it's telling us over in the Torah. If it works, great, that's the bonus. If it doesn't work, at least you yourself are lifting yourself up to a place. We will be the example to ourselves, to the people around us, and that will be the biggest stance for the embers for the truth that is around. And the truth be told, we find in the Parsha later on that this is the birth of Yaakov and Esau, which is going to be this diametrically opposed relationship that will travel through all the generations. One is up, the other is down. The, one is, the other one is up, the other one is down. There's always going to be this fighting between Yaakov and Esau. Now, we spoke about last week, there are people that are Rishoyim, they're wicked people, and it's very, you've got to stand up to them. It would seem to be in the Torah, there's no bigger rush in the entire world than Esau. As we mentioned, he was born a rush, he was born a wicked man. He was born red, he was born hairy, he was born Esau, his Asu, he was made already as he was. <clears throat> and yet Yaakov loved Esau. So how could it be? Esau was born into the same house as Yaakov Avinu. His father was Yitzchak, his mother was Rivka. Rivka grew up in the house of Rishoyim. She grew up in the house, in the, in the city of wicked people. She knew what Kedusha, she knew what the horror is life. Yitzchak is the son of Avram Avinu. He grew up with a father whose whole life was love and chesed and mercy. Yitzchak was, was a, a living legacy of all that he gained from his father and his mother, Avram and Sarah. So they had a house, and they had two sons. One of them is Yaakov, Ish, Tam, Yoishev, Oilo. He's the, he's the tzaddik that sits in the tents of study and learns and learns and learns and learns and learns. And the other one is Asa of Arasha, who goes on to be the biggest thorn in the side of the Jewish people for all generations since he is born. They couldn't raise him the right way. They couldn't have an influence on him. They didn't see him misbehaving when he was a kid, and they came to straighten him out. Now, Rav Hirsch has in the Chumash a whole 
Mahalach, a whole way to explain what took place in the Chinuch, in the house of Yitzchak and Rivka, of why it is that he feels that Esav never came along and stayed off the derech, as we would say. If Rav Hirsch would never say the words, we have no, we'd be too mechutzif to say such things ourselves. We won't go into it right now. But you see that the best people with the greatest intentions who have created the greatest atmosphere in that house. Could you imagine what it was like to walk into the house of Yitzchak and Rivka? The davening, the kedusha, the Shabbos, the learning, the dvigas in Hashem. Could you imagine Rivka was able to rise over all of the Rishoyim in her town? Yitzchak was the living legacy of his father, Avram and Sarah. And with all that they did, they could not turn their, this son, Esau, they couldn't turn him around. So the Torah is telling us, it's not about how much you're going to be mashpi and influence on other people. You better make sure that you yourself are standing up for the MS. You better make sure that you yourself are living a life that you know that at the end of 120 years, when you go up to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, at least you can say, look, I tried, I tried, I tried. Hashem, it's all about me. And what I did for myself, how I lived my life, how I decided to serve you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I did what I know you want me to do. You decide it's going to be like this and it's going to be like that. You know, it's like the, it's like the, the rub that goes into some sleepy town and he thinks he's going to turn the whole town around. And it comes out after a few years, nothing, nothing. Not a single person is keeping Shabbos more, not a single one is keeping kosher more, not a single one. I tried. What do you want? HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I came in to do my job. I'm doing my avoda. If nobody else is going to come along and, and get pulled in afterwards, that's not up to me. As Rav Yisro Salanto himself said, is that our job is to do what happens after that, that's up to the Rebbe Shalom. That's our job. That is our job to do, to try, to make effort, to stand up for the emiss, for the truth, to be... Rav Shalom Shodron, was the Rebbe of... He was the orator, the darshan of Rav uh, Pesach Kron. He learned from him. He's the Magad that he always speaks about. So he once was called in to a particular place, I believe somewhere maybe in Tel Aviv. He was supposed to give a very, very big drasha about the importance of Shmira Shabbos keeping Shabbos. That's what they were calling him into. He was supposed to come inspire the crowd that they should start keeping Shabbos. When he got to Tel Aviv, he saw besides that they're lacking in the keeping of Shabbos, they're lacking in clothing. And the tzniyos, the modesty that was going on in the streets was horrific. So he got very fired up. And when he got up to speak, instead of opening up with words about Shabbos, he blasted Tel Aviv about the tzniyos issues, about the lack of modesty that was there. And he, he was fired up and he went on and he went on and he went on. And then after he transitioned to Shabbos, and the whole speech was a bomb. The whole thing failed. He didn't inspire anybody. As a matter of fact, people were turned off. And it was a disaster. And the people that had organized the event, they were very disappointed. And he was also disappointed. And he didn't understand. He was, he, he was known to have magic come out of his mouth. He was able to touch the hearts of anyone that would listen to him. He was able to lift them up and make them cry and make them laugh and make them change their lives. And he walks in such an opportunity, hundreds and maybe thousands of people coming to hear him speak. And he missed the mark. And it was a total failure. He went to the Chazanish. He was so sabrach and he was so broken that he failed so miserably. He went to the Chazanish and he asked the Chazanish, what did I do wrong? I don't understand. So the Chazanish said, tell me, what, what, what did you say? So he says, well, I got there, I had a whole drasha prepared only about Shmir Shabbos. But when I saw what's going on with the sneers, with the modesty, the lack of modesty, I decided that I'm going to start off with modesty and then I'll go into Shabbos. And he told them what he said about the immodesty that was going on over there. And then how he went into speaking about Shabbos. And the Chazanish said, that's the problem. Everybody came to hear you speak about Shabbos. They weren't there to hear you blast them 
about the immodesty and the problems of Tznias. So he said, you said the things that were not meant to be said. And therefore you miss the mark in the drosha that you gave, and that's why it was a failure. So he said that he learned from there. Whatever you're asked to speak about, that is what you speak about. So our job is to do what's going to be the result at the end of the day. That's up to the Bari Eilam to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And here we find Rivka was a tzaddikis. She didn't change her father, her brother, her town. She did what she had to do. Yitzchak and Rivka, the two greatest tzaddikim of the generation with such an amazing house of Kedusha. They had a son who was an Esau. They couldn't change him. But it's not their fault. They tried their best. They certainly gave him love and they gave him attention and they smothered him with hugs and kisses and they tried to make charts of, you know, mitzvah boy charts. They tried to do everything with him. Didn't work. Esau has his own bichir, he has his own tafkir, he has his own place in the history of the world and the history of Klal Yisra. So yes, we have to stand up for the truth. And yes, we have to try when we have an opportunity to rebuke those that are doing the wrong thing. If you are the right person at the right time and you have a relationship with a person that you could say something that would be in the right way and you think that maybe the person's going to hear what you have to say, then maybe it's okay to say such a thing. But in the interim, the focus has to be on ourselves. The focus has to be on ourselves and our growth and our Torah and our Kedusha and our love of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, our Yir HaShemayim, our fear of Hashem that helps prevent us from trampling on the mitzvahs and doing things that we shouldn't be doing. It's up to us. What will be? You leave the rest up to Hashem. HaKadosh Baruch Hu will make a decision of how things are supposed to work out. And you don't always see the results here, Sometimes things happen, you know, years and years and years later after a person was doing something, they were working with a certain person, they kept gently telling over this and that and this and that and this and that. You know, there was a video that came out several years ago that they made a, a video, Rav Volba, Rav Shlom Rav Volba was from the greatest, greatest minds of the generation. He was the mashkiach of all the mashkichim which means that a mashkich in yeshiva who's there to guide the young men in the right pathways of Avodah Hashem, he was the mashkich of the mashkich, which means everybody came to him to get, their, to get their advice. He had a yeshiva, he has svarim that are, you can't live as a ben Torah, as a person who's in yeshiva without the works of Rav Obi. He wrote a sefer on chino chabonim, Zriu Binyan, which is a famous work that was translated by Rabbi Kellerman, which is the master of how to raise your kids. One, if not more of his children, went off the derech. And I met one of these sons. I met one of them, was in my house for Shamas. His, and this guy's son lives in Woodland Hills. And there was a video around the time that I met the son, there was a video that went out. And it was uh, showing Rav, Rav Olbe sitting at his Shabbos table on a Friday night with his family and suddenly there's a knock on the door and somebody goes and opens the door and his son, who's no longer from, walks in to the house on Shabbos Friday night. Obviously it was uh, updated with the iPhone in his hand, the keys in his, in his hands and he walks in and Rav Olbe, doesn't look negative, doesn't say a word, he just embraces the son, sits him by the table right next to him, he's like stroking his hand through the video, and they have an amazing, amazing Shabbos experience, and the father didn't say a word, no rebuke, nothing, just Ava, just love. This son was in my house. He's, a, he's now probably in his 60s, so this story took place when he was probably in his teens, 20 years old. And the, and the man came back to Yiddishkeit later, 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 later on in his life. I don't even, I don't even think that his father was Zeichet to see him be from. And I asked him, I said, this video, he says, yeah, the video. I said, it's true. That's what it was like. So he said, you know, the video, it's like, just like a video. It's not exactly the story. He says, but I will tell you. He said, that was my father. My father never once rebuked me. 
never once told me what I'm doing is wrong. Never once. He just embraced and he just loved and he just cared about me. He said, when my father passed away, I was living in America, I was by myself, he was divorced, his kids were elsewhere. So when my father passed away, I went back to Eretz Yisrael. My mother was an older woman, she was all by herself. I decided that I lived so long away from my parents, I'm going to come and move into the house with my mother and take care of my mother. And the last, I forget what it was, 10 years of his mother's life, he lived with his mother in the home that he grew up in, in the religious neighborhood that he abandoned at a much younger age. And he said, the time that I had with my mother and the thoughts of my father being in that house brought me back to Yiddishkeit. And he now lives in Eretz Yisrael, and he has a connection with a very big Rosh Yeshiva in Eretz Yisrael, and he learns in that yeshiva part of the day, and he does his own thing part of the day, and he's an Ehrlich guy. His father did what he had to do. His father was the man of education in Eretz Yisrael. He wrote the book on how to be mechanach, your children, and had a son who went off. The father never saw his son be religious in this world. In that world up there, believe me, he's shepping the nachas, that he lived a certain way, and that hashpa, that influence that he had, even though 10 years after he left the world, his son came around and began keeping mitzvahs again. The grandson told me the story of his grandfather, which also ended up bringing his grandson back. Remember, the, <clears throat> the father was not religious. He got married, they had children. So the children were not really so, so religious. They were, you know, semi. They were living in America. And the parents got divorced. And the mother says, I, I'm going back to Eretz Yisrael, and I'm taking my kids with me. She brings the kids back to Eretz Yisrael, and she says to her, her father-in-law, Rab Volbe, these kids need to be in school. They need to be in a from school to learn what it means to be a Jew. You're the greatest mashkiach in Eretz Yisrael. Can you get your grandkids into a school? So Rabobo wasn't a young man. He didn't have a car. And he schlepped all around Israel with two, these two boys, trying to get them into yeshiva. So this boy told me, do you know what it was like? We're sleeping in the house with our grandfather. Every morning he used to come with his tzitzis, and he used to put them in our ear to wake us up. That's how we woke up. We look up and there's our Zayda with the face of an angel putting his, rubbing his tzitzis into our ears to wake us up. He would wake us up with love, with warmth, with everything. We weren't even so religious. And then he would spend the day going from one yeshiva to another yeshiva trying to get us in. So imagine Rav Olba comes and says, can you take my grandkids into yeshiva? Do you know that not one yeshiva would accept us into their yeshiva. Could you imagine, he said, this is the grandson saying, could you imagine the tsar, the agmas nefesh, the busha, the shame that their grandfather went through? And he never complained. He didn't get upset. He didn't walk out of the office of the Rosh Hashiva and say anything bad. That's how it is. Our job is to do and the rest is up to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And this grandson, Uli Ayin Hara, came around, and he's Shom Shabbos, Kashos, puts on tefillin, learns. He's, uh, I once did on the WhatsApp, I did once did one of his grandfather's books, and he got so excited that we're learning Rav Oba, and he would play for his own children every single day. Listen what, you're, what the, the altar Zayda, what the great-grandfather said. Did the grandfather get to see it? He never saw it. Not here in this world. But in that world, in the world of Emes, a person who stands for the Emes and stands for the truth, even though they don't always see the results in this world, in that world they will see the results. Esav Harasha, 
He's known as Esav. There's not many people in the Torah that are known as Harasha, the wicked one. But he's Esav Harasha, the son of Yitzchak and Rivka. They tried, and they tried, and they tried, and they tried. And the lack of success of being the parents that could raise a Yaakov and also raise an Esav, not held accountable. HaKadosh Baruch Hu has his own cheshman, his own plan. So as we are going through this Tehillim over here, and we're talking about the strength of character that a person must have to be able to withstand and uphold the, the, the crown of Torah and the crown of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, we do have to remind ourselves that it's not always so posh, it's not always so easy. And if you say the wrong thing to the wrong person at the wrong time, you make things a thousand times worse. A thousand times worse. So better off not saying anything. Just be an example. Will they come around? Maybe. And maybe not. Will they become more religious? Maybe. Maybe not. Will they change their attitude? Will they change their bad midas? Will they change their approach to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to the meaning of life? Maybe. Maybe not. And maybe not while you're watching. Maybe it'll be in five years or ten years or twenty years. They remember some mice. That's the famous story with, with Rav, with Rav Arlev Steinman. This story also we told, but we have, we're telling so many stories. We'll tell over another old story. And the story, every, I'm sure that you remember, there was a young boy from B'nai Brak who went totally off the derech of Torah and mitzvahs, totally off. Ad kach, so much so, he told his parents, I can't live in B'nai Brak anymore. He had an uncle, a secular uncle who lived on a kibbutz. He said, I'm going to live with uncle, whatever, Yonatan, who, whatever his name was. And he's living in the kibbutz, and the kibbutz is not far from an Arab village, and this young boy gets involved with the, a young lady in the Arab village, and the next thing you know, he's fallen in love, she's fallen in love, they're going to get married. And he comes to his uncle and he says, Uncle, good news, I get a mazel tov. He says, what's the mazel tov? He says, I became a chassin. I'm getting married. Oh, really? Mazel tov. Who's the girl? Fatma. What, what do you mean? What does that mean? He says, you know, the village over there, the Arabs, I met such a wonderful girl. She's beautiful. She's nice. She's kind of everything. Exactly what I'm looking for. We're getting married. So the uncle, secular Israeli on the kibbutz, begins telling his, 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 his nephew, are you kidding me? You're a Jew. You can't marry an Arab girl. You can't do... Don't tell me what I can do, what I can't do. I know what I want. I'm in love. That's what I'm marrying. So the uncle says, listen, at least, I know you don't talk to your parents that much. You don't go there very often. But at least have common decency. Go to your parents and let them know what you're doing. They should know that you're getting married. So the boy said, fine. I'll give my parents the last respect that they deserve to know that I'm going to get married. I don't think they'll be very happy that I'm marrying an Arab woman, but I'll let them know. So he calls his parents, and he says, Abba Ima, he said, I haven't seen you in a long time, I know. I was wondering, can I come for Shabbos? We have a very important announcement to let you know. They said, Shabbos? You want to come for Shabbos? You know what Sh Yeah, I'll come for Shabbos. You can't tell me what to do, what not to do. I'll keep Shabbos the way that I keep Shabbos. I'll come to you. They said, fine, we, our son will be delighted to have you. So he comes to Shabbos, he shows up in his jeans and his ripped jeans and his shirt and no yarmulke and earrings and tattoo, all over the whole thing. Friday night, the father's getting ready to go to shul. He says, no, yes, you want to come? No, I'm not going to shul. I'll stay here. His father says, shul, he's standing on the balcony smoking a cigarette as Shabbos is entering into the streets of B'nai Brak. He comes home. And the boy is sitting by the meal, and they have the suit, everything, the meal's over, and so the parents are so, well, yes, what do, you, what do you want to tell us? So I wanted to let you know that I'm engaged, and I'm getting married very soon, like next week. Wow, really? Wow. Who's the girl? Fatma. What? Yes, you know, there's a village by uncle's kibbutz, and we got, fell in love with each other, and we're getting married next week. I just felt that I should tell you before I move on to the next stage of my life that I'm getting married. If the parents weren't devastated already, you can imagine this was the straw that broke the camel's back. They were devastated. Sure, boom. 
Don't tell me what to do. I know what I'm doing. Okay? Next morning, father's going to shul. Son is sleeping. Goes to shul. He comes back. Son joins him for the meal. They eat the meal. They don't say a word about this news from the night before. <laughs> Shabbos afternoon, the boy goes out onto the balcony in B'nai Brak, smoking the cigarette on Shabbos in B'nai Brak. The parents, to their credit, they don't say a word. It's the afternoon. The father's getting ready to leave the house to go to a shear. His son's sitting on the couch. He says, Yossi, I'm going to a shear of Rev. Arnav Steinman in his house. Would you like to come with me? And the boy thinks for a minute. And he says, yeah, I would like to come. Okay? Brings the boy, Rev. Arnav Steinman. And he goes there and there's a shear. Everybody, Charedim of B'nai Brak and this boy that is there. At the end of the year, everybody goes to Rav Aaron Leib Shleiman to, to say good Shabbos. And the father leans over and says, Rebbe, he says, this is the only chance that I have. My son is engaged to an Arab woman. He's getting married next week. He says, if there's anything you could say, please, please. Rav Aaron Leib Shleiman, boy walks in. He takes his hand, he looks at him. He says, can I ask you a question? He says, yes. He says, how long has it been since you kept Shamus? Boy says, three years. He says, in those three years, was there ever a time that you had hurry tshuva, that you had thoughts of doing tshuva? And the boy thinks and he says, yes. In those three years, how many times would you, would you say? He said, about four or five times. And he says, in those four or five times, how long did you have those thoughts for? He said, each time, a few minutes. And Rav Ayn Leib Shaiman holding his hand says, I'm so jealous of you. Rabbi, you're jealous of me? Yes. He said, because Chazal tell us, in the place where the Bali Tshuva stand, Ain't Sande Gomer Yochoi Lamoid, Ain't Sande Gomer cannot stand. He says, In those five times, for those few minutes, you were about Shuva. You're standing in a place that's so high and so lofty, greater than I could ever reach myself. I'm jealous of the Chalik and of the Mahabo that you have waiting for you in the world to come. And he wished them a good Shabbos. And the boy walks out of the you know, Arnav house. He's in absolute shock. He's jealous of me because for three or four times I thought to myself, maybe I should do tshuva. I'm living Chil Shabbos, eating treif. I'm about to marry an Arab woman. He's jealous of me. And that got the boy thinking and slowly but surely, he ended up being chizer the tshuva. He became a firm young man. Of course, he dropped the girl. He dropped his lifestyle and he went back to becoming religious. He's now holding by the day of his actual chasana. He's about to get married now to a nice room young lady. And the father says to him before the wedding, Yossi, I just have one question I have to ask. You have no idea. My heart sings with joy. I'm so excited for you and everything you accomplished. Now you're getting married to start your own house. I have one question. When you came that Shabbos to tell us that you were going to marry the Arab girl and I invite you to the shear with Rabbi Aaron Leib, why did you come? Didn't make any sense. Why did you come? He said, Ah, but that's easy. You don't remember? No, I don't. He said, When I was a young boy in Cheder, we once finished a whole Mishnah, a whole, uh, a whole uh, Mishnah in Mishnayis. And the, the prize for the class was we're going to the Godel Ador of Arnab's time to get tested by him. You remember, I wasn't a good student. I, was, I had a very hard time learning. I had a really difficult time in Cheda, and I was so nervous going there. And sure enough, Ron Leib is going around the room asking everybody a question. Everybody answers right away. Everybody answers until he gets to me. And the Rebbe leans into his ear and he says, he's not so smart. Ask him an easy question. And if Ron Leib asks me a question, and I have no idea what he's talking about. So the Rebbe leans in, ask him something easier. 
he asks me a very easy question. I had no idea what he was talking about. He asks me the easiest question you could possibly ask on this mesecht, on this tractate. And by that point, I was so flustered, I could not answer the question. I was so embarrassed. As everybody is leaving the house of the Rosh Hashiva, he's passing out candy to every single boy. And when my turn comes, he calls me over after everybody else left. And he says, you, you get three candies. I said, for what, Remy? He said, everybody got a candy for answering the question. He says, but in Yiddishkeit, we don't go by what you accomplish. We go based on the effort that you put in. And you tried three times harder than everybody else. So you get three candies. He looks at his father and says, Abba, in all of my years in yeshiva, he's the only one who ever made me feel good for the effort that I put in and tried to accomplish. When you told me that you're going to his shir, I wanted to see him again. And Taka, what was the message that he ended up telling this boy? Wow, five times you thought about doing tshuva? You're a tzaddik, you're a bal tshuva? I'm jealous of you. The Torah wants from us to try our best to do our best. We can't be responsible for everybody else. It's a world of bechira, free will. Every person has their free will. You see someone doing the wrong thing, it hurts. You want to change them? Maybe you will, maybe you won't. But if we work, like Rabbi Yisrael Salanta said, we'll change ourselves, we'll become greater people, then like Rav Volba was able not to ever criticize his son. And 10 years after his father passed away, his son, who's 60 something years old, is sitting in yeshiva learning in the morning. Your efforts will never go un unwarranted or unwanted. HaKadosh Baruch Hu will save everything and it penetrates the hearts of those around. Even if you don't see the person's making changes, you don't know what's going on under the surface. You don't know what's going on. Yaakov and Esav grew up in the same exact house. The same exact house. Yaakov, Tzadik, Esav, HaRasha. Rivka grew up in a house of Rishoyim. She grew up in the city of Rishoyim. And it never stopped her once from becoming the righteous woman that she was. So Be'ez Hashem Yizbarach, we will continue to take the messages of David HaMelech and his Tehillim, will take the messages of the Torah HaKadosh itself, and we will just continue to be try to become the greatest person that we could be. And if we're zeichet to influence those around us, what a schos that we have. If we're not, because HaKadosh Baruch Hu has other cheshbon, has other plans, at least after 120 years, when we go to Shemayim, we can tell HaKadosh Baruch Hu, like it says, Avram was born by Yom and he came with his days in his hands. Says the Zayar, what does that mean? He showed all of his days to HaKadosh Baruch and he says, You know that every day that I had in my life, I used it to the best of its abilities possible. I did what I could. I tried my best. Did I change the world? Did I change this person? Did I change that? It's not my job. My job is to try. And in Yitz Hashem, if we keep trying, that's the chizik for each and every one of us. Hashem is just measuring us. He's not measuring us against anybody else, just measuring us against ourselves. Are you growing? Are you doing more? Are you improving? Are you becoming a better Jew, a better person, working on yourself, elevating yourself? If we do, Be'ezras Hashem. So then we have the schus to be people that stand up for the truth. We have schus to stand up for the covet and the glory of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And at least at the end of days, we'll be able to say proudly about ourselves, we did our best job, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The rest, that's up to you. I'm just here to do your service. What, what the results are, only HaKadosh Baruch Hu knows. May we be Zeichem Yetz Hashem.
to grow for ourselves and to see the results in ourselves and have a schus that even in this world, Be'ez Hashem, to see the results that we are aiming for with the people around us. Thank you. You're welcome.